so we start this uh, this uh, session and uh, before the session uh, which it will be will be chaired by my colleague Gander i have to announce uh, the winner of the simai 2015 uh, prize uh, who is uh, Paola Antonietti. <laughs> Congratulations, <laughs> Paola. And uh, uh, actually, you will say a few words about her. Yeah. Uh, you know her uh, quite well. I just have to, to, just to say that this is uh, the most important CMI prize. And the invited lecture is part of the reward to the winner. And uh, I also wish to mention that it's not CMI who grants the prize. CMI only organizes, but the, the, uh, the candidates are examined by a European level board, an official one, say the presidents of the, of the European society, etc., etc. And so, uh, as a president of CIMA, I am very happy of this, uh, of this presence because I know Paola since uh, uh, a few years, say. And uh, I just want to, to mention, but then Gander will go to the, to the scientific aspects, that she is uh, a mother of a little girl of four years old. And uh, my grandchild, who is uh, six years old, is looking forward to meet this little girl. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for this nice uh, start. So it's a great pleasure to uh, present Paola for this uh, prize lecture. Paola got her PhD in 2007 from Pavia. She was also spending part of her time at Oxford while she was working on the PhD. Then she spent about a year in Nottingham University before coming to the MOX here, where she has been uh, ever since. She is very well known for her work in discontinuous Galerkin methods. She has also constructed preconditioners for uh, these systems that you obtain when you use such discretizations. In particular, there are domain decomposition preconditioners and uh, domain decomposition in my field of uh, expertise. So I have been looking at her work and uh, one, one of the most cited ones has in the title a weird uh, sentence. It says it studies domain decomposition methods and in particular Schwartz methods for a non-overlapping case. Now the ones of you who have looked at Schwartz methods, they know that Schwartz methods need overlap to work. If they don't overlap, they don't work. And so in the title it says non-overlapping. So I looked uh, more carefully at this and uh, We've worked on this as well in the meantime. I, you might not have seen this yet. And one can interpret these methods as a different class of Schwartz methods where there is indeed no, no overlap, but they still work. So I have a lot of interest in the work of Paola. We also had about three years ago an interesting discussion by email about the Helmholtz equation. And she had discovered some interesting spectra of discretized Helmholtz equations with methods that she will describe, I think, in her talk. And I think we did not quite agree yet on uh, why this is and how this is uh, coming, but I hope that she will be able to tell us in this talk uh, a bit more about it. So I'm looking forward to this talk. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Martin, for the nice introduction. Thanks to Nicola. And uh, before uh, starting, uh, um, I want to thank uh, the CMI Scientific Committee as well as the member of the International Panels for uh, the uh, CMI 2015 prize. I'm truly honored uh, to receive this prize. And uh, let me also thank the organizing committee for the opportunity to present my results uh, today. So unfortunately, I'm sorry, Martin, 
the talk is going to deal with a different topic, so no preconditioners today. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> thank you very much. But in the domain decomposition philosophy, so it's <laughs> so this. Uh, uh, today I want uh, to present to you some uh, our results we obtain in the framework of uh, simulating large-scale um, uh, seismic phenomena at a regional scale and. Uh, uh, let me be briefly describe you uh, the problem we have to uh, we want to face. Uh, so we uh, we want to simulate the larger scale earthquakes uh, at a regional scale. So this means that we want to take into account uh, from the seismic source uh, through the propagation through Earth's layers of uh, seismic waves, uh, as well as topographic effects uh, and uh, uh, lateral uh, heterogeneities that uh, the soil may features and. Uh, the interaction with the uh, man-made infrastructures, so uh, soil uh, interactions. And why the, we think this uh, could be uh, important? Because uh, uh, deterministic simulations uh, can be used to improve seismic hazard analysis um, in addition to classical empirical laws and statistical and historical uh, data, as well as they can be employed in principle to uh, perform a dynamic as an analysis of uh, a structural system as well as to improve the plan of protection strategies and uh, the estimate of potential damage losses. Uh, as you can imagine, this, is, uh, uh, this research is highly interdisciplinary, so these are uh, people that are involved in this project from the MOX laboratory, Professor Quarteroni and Ilario Mazzieri and Alberto Ferroni. We, then we work a lot with the um, uh, engineers of, uh, the seismic engineers of the department of, uh, ex department of uh, um, uh, civil engineer, so the group is led by Professor Paolucci and then there is a Chiara Smerzini, Ali uh, Hashemi and uh, Roberto Guidotti, a former PhD student that now is at uh, Illinois. And uh, um, Francesco Gatti, that is a joint PhD student between here and Paris. And then we have the industrial counterpart. So Marco Stumazzini, that is a former um, member of Politecnico di Milano, now has moved to Munich Re, which is the um, largest reinsurance company worldwide. And uh, with uh, him, we have a strong collaboration for the very beginning of the project. Because uh, our deterministic simulation of potential hurt Earthquakes are currently employed within the Munich Re um, uh, system to uh, estimate potential losses and damages in case of earthquakes in uh, large uh, areas worldwide that may, might be affected by uh, extreme events. So, just to give you an idea of uh, the problem and why. Uh, so we are interested in this. Uh, this is the uh, Italian earthquake potential hazard map. Uh, this year is dated to uh, last year from uh, the civil uh, defense um, department. And as uh, unfortunately all of us know due to the recent events, uh, most of the uh, Italian <laughs> Uh, most of Italy is uh, potentially uh, subjected to uh, extreme events, so to large earthquakes. And in general, uh, so red of course means uh, uh, high uh, potential uh, hazard. And uh, this is a map taken from the United States earthquake website that shows the uh, uh, so the, the perceived intensity of the earthquake of that uh, happened in L'Aquila in uh, 2009, and red means extreme event. Okay. So be, be, before going into the mathematical details, let me tell you a couple of uh, uh, things, which I think most of you knows, but uh, just to fix the idea of what. Uh, uh, of about seismic waves. So seismic waves can be divided into uh, body waves, so the ones that travels from the seismic source towards uh, the earth layers, and then they reach the surface of the earth and then become uh, surface waves. So body waves are further decomposed in compressional or primary waves and transverse or secondary waves. And I'll spend a couple of words on these two um, uh, on the main differences about, uh, uh, between a compressional and transverse waves in a second. 
And uh, let me just mention that uh, so compressional and transverse waves travels at different velocities, and this information is usually employed to locate uh, uh, the seismic source of uh, an earthquake. So what are the main difference between P waves and S wave? As I already told you, um, P waves are faster. They usually travel from 1 to 14 kilometers per second, whereas uh, uh, shear waves are uh, slower. Uh, and uh, so for compressional P waves, uh, the, um, the ground is vibrating in a direction which is uh, mm, uh, perpendicular to that the wave is propagating, uh, whereas for transverse wave, the, the induced motion in the, uh, is in uh, the direction perpendicular to that the wave is propagating. And uh, uh, as you can imagine, in a case of an earthquake, S waves are uh, those that um, induce the major um, losses. And uh, they are characterized by their velocity, which are given by these two relations here, lambda and mu are the Lamy parameters that characterize the medium, and rho is the mass density. And finally, so P wave compressional waves travel through all type of media, whereas transverse wave travels only through solid media. And within this uh, uh, research line, we have developed a computational code that is called SPEED. SPEED stands for Spectral Element in Elastodynamics with Discontinuous Galerkin. This is an open source Fortran code for seismic wave propagation in 3D complex and heterogeneous media. And as already told you in the, in the acronym, it is based on a discontinuous spectral element code that uh, uh, exploits somehow um, a domain decomposition paradigm. And I'll make this more clear in a couple of seconds. And uh, as you can imagine, the, the typical size of such a problem is uh, very huge. So uh, in terms of number of degrees of freedom, a typical simulation can have uh, from a few, a few uh, hundred to several hundred millions of unknowns. So this means that, of course, we have to uh, heavily exploit massively parallel architectures. And in 2013, SPEED has been selected within the European project PRAISE as an emerging application of potentially in a high interest in industry. And just to give, me, to give you an idea of which kind of problem we want to uh, Simulate, just let me show you a, a quick video. This is uh, this referring to the um, uh, to the earthquake of L'Aquila in 2009, uh, sorry, of uh, Mirandola, so in the north of Italy, 2009. This is Mirandola, which was the main affected area. This is a zoom of the stratigraphy as well as the soil properties. And here you see the simulation. This is the velocities recorded, so computed from north to south. And you clearly see that body waves become surface waves. And these, again, are the velocities. And these are a comparison between the computed records at different stations and um, the measured records and the computed records. So, and you can see that there is a pretty much a, a nice agreement uh, between uh, the recorded data and the numerical simulations. Okay. So, let's go a little bit into the mathematical details. Okay. So behind the seismic uh, wave propagation phenomena with almost uh, the same technology, we can effort uh, slightly more different applications. For example, the study of dynamic soil structure interaction effects. This is uh, the uh, Aqua Santa Bridge in uh, Liguria, and as well as the um, vibration induced by high-speed train. But today I'll focus on uh, seismic wave propagation phenomena. And uh, so th this is a wave propagation problem. So which are the main feature and numerical schemes must satisfy uh, in order to be well suited to treat such kind of problems? So of course it must be flexible because these problems are often characterized by very complex geometries and highly heterogeneous media. 
on, and of course it must be accurate because we want to, po propag to um, propagate accurately uh, the waves. So it has to avoid dispersive effect as well as uh, dissipation effects. And it must be efficient in order to deal with uh, such a large number of unknowns uh, in a reasonable time. For such a reason, we have decided to look for discontinuous Golurkin spectral element methods. So this, the, the approach I'm going to present uh, couple the flexibility of this continuous Golurkin approach with the accuracy of spectral element methods uh, with the, a domain decomposition approach in order to minimize the proliferation of unknowns which uh, uh, characterize these continuous Galerkin methods. And this is a list of people that have uh, uh, somehow studied, so it's a very incomplete list, so I apologize if I miss uh, some of the results in the literature, uh, that uh, have studied these continuous Galerkin methods for elastodynamics equations. And here, finally, the, uh, these are the equations. So we are interested in uh, approximating the displacement U of an elastic medium subjected to an external force F. So these are the equation of the linear elastodynamics. Here, G is a datum. And of course, we have to supplement the equations with the suitable uh, initial conditions. And I'm, for the theory, I'm going to focus on this uh, simplified model, but then in practice, of course, you have to take into account viscoelastic forces that in uh, their simplest way can be modeled adding a term which is proportional to both the displacement and the velocity scaled by a suitable dumping factor which is uh, of order 10 to the power minus 2 in, uh, for such kind of applications. And here, some slight more notation. Uh, this is uh, all of this is pretty much standard. U is the displacement, as I already said. Epsilon of U is the strain tensor, and we are going to assume the hook loses. So uh, the strain, uh, the stress tensor is uh, related to the strain tensor through. Uh, a uniformly bounded symmetric positive definite a stiffness tensor D, which encodes the material properties through the Lamé parameters. And rho is the mass densities, and again, these are uh, the compressional waves velocity and the shear wave velocity. And uh, it's very easy. You can write down the weak form of your equation, and then you can have a look to the book of Ravia Thomas or Duvan Lyons, and you immediately figure out that this problem is well posed and depends continuously on the data, provided these two the data are regular enough. And now, here comes the main philosophy behind speed. So, this method is based on a three level decomposition. So, at the first level, we decompose. Uh, our computational domain to into a number of non-overlapping substructures. These decompositions into blocks is usually provided by engineers and take into account the different heterogeneities or uh, the complex feature of uh, the um, computational domain. Then we do have a second level so each of these blocks uh, is meshed independently one from another with a computational grid. And to any of these blocks, uh, we assign a polynomial approximation degree, which is a, an integral number greater than or equal to one that, of course, may vary from one block to the other. So any block is treated in a completely uh, independent way. And then, of course, it comes the first level. So on top of this, in each of the blocks, so we construct a conforming uh, spectral element method. So we approximate our discrete displa uh, displacement with a polynomial of the given degree. And uh, how we take into account the fact that in origin we have to deal with a global problem, we simply attach the solution with a discontinuous Galerkin approach to take into account the fact that the mesh can be, of course, be non-matching as well. The polynomial approximation degree may be different uh, from one block to the other. So with such a way, the, the computational grid and the polynomial approximation degree, so the discretization parameters can be tuned to the regions of interest. And uh, now, on each block, we can consider either hexahedral me uh, meshes in the classical spirit of spectral element methods or tetrahedral spectral element methods. So we can also consider blocks meshed by uh, tetrahedral elements. So 
to summarize our discrete displacement is going to be a function which is discontinuous across the skeleton of my subdomain partition, continuous, so a continuous polynomials within each uh, subdomains and a polynomial of degree PK within each sub when restricted to mesh elements of any block. Uh, when you try, try decide to employ the spectral element methods, then you, of course you have to specify which kind of basis function you are going to use to represent your uh, discrete solution and your test functions. And in the case of your subdomain is subdivided into hexahedral elements, then of course you use the classical spectral element approach. So you are going to use a, a, a classical Lagrangian shape function associated with the Gauss-Legendre Lobato nodes. Uh, whereas if you use, um, uh, if you decide to use a tetrahedral grid for your block, then you can employ the so-called C0 boundary adapted basis, which is a variant, a modification of the original uh, HP basis of Dubiner proposed in, uh, uh, in the early 90s, which has been uh, modified in order to provide a continuous approximation. And this is due to the group of Shervin in 2005. And of course you can also, so if you are a great fan of uh, this continuous Galerkin method and you want to employ them at an element-wise level, so you can simply decide that each element is a subdomain. And this of course tells you that everything I'm going to say in the following applies directly also to an element-wise DG approach. Here we have used to um, this domain decomposition approach because uh, the typical size of this problem is so huge that you cannot effort to take into account all the degrees of freedom that pop up when you use a, an element-wise DG approach. And uh, so given um, our functions are going to jump from one subdomain to the other, we need the classical uh, trace operators that uh, uh, takes into account the jump of a vector valid function as well as weighted average. So if here you have one half, this is the standard average, one half the value on the left plus one half the, the value on the right. And you d can define exactly the same quantity for uh, regular enough tensor uh, valued um, uh, functions. And uh, this is a pretty much standard notation, but it is going to appear in a second because here is my uh, weak formulation. So for a semi-discrete formulation for any time t between zero and an observation time capital T, I look for a discrete displacement in my HP space that satisfies this equation for any trial um, test function V. And the only difference between uh, the continuous weak formulation and its uh, discrete counterpart it comes in the definition of this bilinear form, which has, of course, a volume term that is exactly the same as uh, for uh, the, uh, the continuous level. But then there are three terms that are very typically of, of this continuous Golurkin methods. This is the most important one. This guy penalizes the jump of the discrete solution across the subdomains. So in somehow it encodes the fact that at the end we are going to look for a continuous function. This guy is also important because it takes into account, so it ensures that our uh, discrete formulation is uh, um, consistent when you integrate back by parts to get your original problem. And this guy, which is a zero any time that W is regular enough, so it has uh, zero jumps, uh, is added to uh, restore symmetry of the bilinear form. And suitably choosing this uh, delta here in the weighted average, you can cook up uh, different uh, discontinuous Golurkin methods. So the standard average, so delta e equal to uh, 0 0.5, is the original symmetric interior penalty method of uh, Mary Wheeler and uh, Doug Arnold. Or you, if you cook up a value different from one half, you get the method of uh, Stenberg. And uh, the key point is that if you want that this method works, you have to co uh, carefully choose this guy that is called uh, stabilization function. This guy must uh, be proportional to P square, so the polynomial approximation degree you employ in each subdomain divided by uh, basically the mesh size. And then you have here, this is uh, the material properties, and then you have a number that you are free to choose, but it must uh, be uh, sufficiently large in order to 
um, be sure that this bilinear form is coercive. Uh, if you are not happy, I'll go very quickly through this slide because it's quite hopeful. So if you are not happy only to work with displacement-based methods, you can basically do everything I've already done in a mixed formulation. So you have both UH and sigma H as unknown, and you can derive a number of methods. And what I'm going to tell you about the, the theoretical results also <coughs> apply to these families of methods. These in practical application are not very convenient because the number of unknown is uh, really huge, so it, it, they are really expensive. The first thing we have analyzed is the stability of the formulation. So this means that you, we want to bound the discrete solution at any time step by the data. And this is exactly what is written here in the simplest case where we don't have boundary data, but everything applies also to the case of non-null boundary data. So for any time t, uh, the discrete displacement is bounded by the initial data as well the sourcing term in a measure in a natural energy norm that comes from the problem. So this is the L2 norm of the velocity and then you have to measure uh, the displacement in a suitable the G norm which is basically the H1 norm plus the terms that takes into account that your discrete solution jumps from one um, uh, block to the other. And the same results, all the four uh, displacement stress formulations, actually for some of them, it, it, can, it is possible to prove that they are fully conservative, so this means that this is a, an equality. And all this analysis has been carried out in a unified setting, working with the so-called flux formulation uh, originally proposed for the Laplace problem by Arnold, Bressi, Cobur, and Marini. And then, uh, once you know that your scheme is stable, of course you are interested in error estimate. This, this is the main result that tells you that basically uh, your semi-discrete approximate a solution approximates the continuous one, uh, which is supposed to be a sufficiently regular function with optimal rate with respect to h to the mesh size, because the here you can read h to the power p, so if the solution is sufficiently irregular here, you get the uh, expected uh, rate h to the power p, where p is, a, uh, is the approximation order. And here you have also the explicit bound in p, so in the p version setting of the method, which, uh, uh, I mean, for non-expert, uh, this is slightly suboptimal by a factor of one half. So you would expect p to the k minus one. But this is typically of discontinuous Golurkin method. So this is known also for a much more simple equation like uh, the Laplace equation. Uh, you can recover optimal p bounds if in the theoretical analysis if uh, you for example you are able to construct a continuous interpolant from uh, your um, continuous solution to your discrete space or if your continuous displacement belongs to a so, uh, suited uh, augmented Sobolev space. But uh, this is not surprising at all if you are a little bit involved in the, P, uh, so in the analysis of DG method in its high order version. And the same kind of estimates, again, holds for displacement stress formulation uh, in, a, in a slightly different energy norm, of, of course. And now, we are not yet satisfied, so for at this point we can use either tetrahedral or hexahedral elements, but this might be uh, not enough if your doma uh, domain is very complex. So if you think that your domain has a number of faults or fractures or whatever you want, but it is complex, the process of generating the grid m much m can be much more expensive than the simulation itself. So you can spend days and days in creating a grid and then just a few hours to run the simulation. So what, what we are looking at now is to using general polyhedral grids. And why polyhedral grids can be of any interest in principle? Because then mesh generation becomes straightforward. So you, this is the cartoon. You have your domain, and here you have, for example, a, a layer that you want to track carefully in your process of mesh generation. Then you simply construct your block. So fa and you stick on top, on each of these blocks, a, a regular grid made by, for example, hexahedral elements. And then 
in the elements that, that, that cut your layers, you simply subdivide them in order to follow the geometry. And then, of course, this leads very rapidly to elements that may have arbitrary shape. So given that this continuous Galerkian method in recent years, very recent, uh, have shown to work uh, perfectly, naturally, on arbitrary shape element, we want to take into account such a flexibility also to deal with arbitrary shaped elements. Of course, uh, given that it's very difficult to enforce continuity between one polytopic element to the other, in the regions where you have these strange layers of these very difficult geometries, then here we are going to uh, restore to an element-wise DG approach. But in general, you can really handle very strange elements and everything still works. And this is exactly, so this is an example of grid. This is, of course, a naive grid. And this is just to give you an idea of uh, uh, how much complicated can be the geometry in, in practical applications. And here is what happens to our formulations on uh, whenever uh, poly polyhedral elements pop up. Basically nothing. Of course, you have to enrich your skeleton of, of by the faces that belongs to the polygons, but the formulation remains exactly the same. Everything still works. The only thing you have to do at the, the theoretical level is to change appropriately the definition of your stabilization function. So here it pops up uh, this quantity that is basically uh, the constant of uh, uh, the inverse trace, uh, the trace inverse inequality. This can be estimated, and let me also mention that in practice, people usually chosen this guy to be equal to 10, and this works also on, poly, uh, on polyhedral elements. So this is for the theoretical definition, but, uh, and then basically in practice you do exactly what you would do on classical shaped elements. And this is a, a list of the very recent paper, uh, papers where people have started to study this continuous Galerkian method uh, in its high order version on arbitrary shape element. In particular, there is this uh, paper, the review paper that contains most of the results that are here. And so this, all this paper fe um, focus on, on the Laplace equation. So here is the results, so the corresponding results for the Lasso dynamic equations basically is a, just a copy of the previous slides because you can prove <coughs> exactly the same kind of results. So your, the formulation is this table, so your discrete solution is bounded by uh, the data, and it provides uh, the same kind of approximation rates uh, that I've shown you before. And now, once you have your semi-discrete formulation and you know that uh, it works as exactly as expected, you go forward and proceed to time integration. So for such kind of application, the most famous the time integrated scheme is the leapfrog method, which is a second order conditionally stable explicit uh, scheme. Uh, you, we have also tried other time integration schemes like a high order runga kuta method and we have recently developed a DG method also for integrating in time, but for the moment I'm going to show you the results only for this uh, leapfrog integration schemes, which is the one that is mostly used in such kind of applications. And um, again, uh, since uh, our uh, time integrator scheme is uh, uh, explicit, of course, uh, it is uh, only conditionally stable. So the first thing we have to, uh, you have to carefully track is how your time integration step depends on the space discretization parameters. And this is a very well uh, known uh, dependence. So it depends linearly on the space discretization uh, step size and quadratically on the polynomial approximation degree. And this is a computation that uh, computes this uh, CFL constant as P grows up. This is uh, the symmetric interior penalty I presented before. This is a, a non-symmetric version that we have tested uh, to see how it behaves a non-symmetric, but is not important at this stage. And then we have compared uh, these numbers with the uh, corresponding ones we have obtained in the case of a fully conforming spectral element approximation. And from this number, we, 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 you can infer that uh, the constant, so uh, this continuous 
interleukin methods provides a slightly more um, straight constraint on the maximum step size you are allowed of approximately uh, 70%. Uh, and the non-symmetric version doesn't work. I mean, it's, it's even worse that it's symmetric version. So this must be taken into account, but I will show you in a second that if you use a, a discontinuous approach and you tune your discretization parameters, you can get exactly the same uh, results as spectral elements, but uh, with much more, uh, less degrees of freedom. Uh, this is uh, just uh, a convergence uh, test on, uh, with a very smooth uh, analytical solution to show you that uh, basically our discontinuous Golurkin spectral element method has approximation constants that are almost the same as the corresponding ones provided by the fully uh, conforming approach. And uh, the expected rates of, of convergence with respect to the mesh size are obtained for different values of the polynomial approximation degree. Okay, I'll skip this even if it is much uh, very important and it regards uh, dispersion and dissipation errors. I just want to say that both <laughs> our discontinuous Golurkin approach uh, feature uh, dispersion and dissipation error which are comparable to the one provided by classical spectral element methods. So basically dissipation and dispersion error are negligible if enough, enough points are used per wavelength. And here, a very famous test. So this is called layer over all space, uh, and it has been proposed in this paper of 2001. Uh, this is one quarter of four symmetric blocks. So here you have a medium, and then on, on top of this you have the layer. Uh, here we are using um, uh, absorbing boundary condition everywhere except on the top where we use a uh, null uh, um, Neumann boundary condition. This is the seismic source where we impose uh, this momentum and then we record the data at this red point here. And these are the mechanical characteristics of these two elements. So the layer on top and the half space on bottom. And these are the results, so we have run a couple of simulations. This is a fully conforming grid that is been, uh, has been uh, 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 designed in order to test a fully spectral element approach. And this is a non-conforming grid where we also vary the polynomial approximation degree. And here are the data of the problem. So this is the uh, number of elements in the spectral element case, and this is the number of elements in, uh, in the discontinuous Golurkin spectral element <coughs> approach. Uh, this is the polynomial approximation employed. This here are the number of degrees of freedom. So 150 million for the fully conforming, 30 million in the discontinuous Golurkin spectral element case. So there is a factor of 50. And here you see the um, the velocity computed uh, in the three different components, uh, the blue lines are the fully conforming approach, the red lines are uh, the discontinuous approach. And I'm, it's not, I'm not sure you can see it, but behind the, the data there is a black line. This is the semi-analytic solution. So in both cases we are uh, able to reproduce uh, correctly uh, uh, the, the semi-analytic solution, but saving a factor of five in the number of the, the, uh, the degrees of freedom with the discontinuous Golurkin approach. And we have done the same kind of experiment employing an aggregate. So here in this quarter where the receiver is located, we have employed a tetrahedral spectral element with a polynomial approximation degree five on top and four on bottom. And the, res the results are uh, basically in line with the semi-analytic solution that you can see here. But because here we are starting a little bit of missing the semi-analytic solution, which is again in black. And now, let me finally present you some applications. Okay. So I will start from the Emilia earthquake of uh, 2011 and then uh, show you some results of the Christchurch earthquake of 2000 and, uh, sorry, 2012 and 2011, and then if I have time, uh, some details on this Aqua Santa bridge in Italy. So here is what happened in Italy in 2012. So this is... Uh, uh, the collapse of the San Francesco church, these are the data, uh, the structural data, and these are 
the two location on the of the two main shocks that happens in uh, 20 May and 29 of May. And this is uh, uh, a very, um, so there has been a, a lot of studies on uh, this uh, seismic event because there is an, uh, an exceptional availability of data because it is almost everything is known about the soil properties of that regions and there are a lot of receivers in this uh, uh, region so there are really a lot of data uh, to, to, to be used to compare uh, with the, the, the numerical results and this is uh, uh, so from uh, the, uh, the Munich Ray made a an estimate of the losses in terms of uh, economical losses uh, due to the earthquake and the estimate is approximately 13 billions of euro. And uh, the, the, this is the, the other point is that this site was selected some years ago as a possible site for a nuclear plant <laughs> because that region is known to have a very low risk of uh, 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 seismic hazard. And here, uh, w what happens, uh, so this is our computational domain, this is where Mirandola is uh, uh, located, and this is a characteristic of the soil, so the stratigraphy, and here we have compared uh, the results obtained through our simulation, these are uh, uh, one, two, three, four. 10 different receivers located in the surrounding region of uh, Mirandola and the black lines are the recorded data and the red lines are the ones obtained by the simulation. So you can see that there are the quite uh, a nice agreement between uh, the data that has been registered by the receivers and the ones computed through the simulations. And th just to give you an idea of the size of uh, such a problem, so this was two, two millions of elements so 300 and millions of elements, it uh, um, uh, took five hours on uh, this uh, Fermi supercomputer at uh, Cineca. And uh, this is a comparison between the map of permanent ground uplift induced after the seismic event. These are the computed data and these are compared with the data acquired by the satellite. So this tells you that here uh, near the IPO center, there has been a quite uh, uh, impressive permanent uh, uh, ground lift after the seismic event. And this is uh, some study on the scalability that have been carried out by uh, Pari de Dania at uh, Cineca to test the scalability of the whole code. Uh, the second example I want to show you is the Christchurch earthquake in New Zealand. In, in this example, we also included in our simulation the presence of the city. So the man-made infrastructure are part of our computational domain. So Christchurch is uh, a small city in the Canterbury Plains in New Zealand. And... Uh, here is the computational domain. So this is the typical size of the elements in the, in the, in the soil. And then, of course, as, as long as you get to the surf layers, you, in, um, you decrease the mesh size in order to capture the small scales. And then, of course, on, uh, to represent the city, which is a zoom over here, uh, you have to use a very fine uh, mesh in order to uh, provide an accurate description of uh, uh, the geometry. And these again are some details of our simulation. These are the mechanical properties. This is the damping. And on, uh, to describe the city, we have used piecewise linear polynomials with a very, very fine grid. And uh, from our numerical simulation, what we observe is that uh, uh, the city somehow, so man-made infrastructure, uh, uh, may have an, uh, an active role during a seismic event because buildings retain energy and then release it. And these are the computation obtained uh, without or with the presence of the city. And you can see that what the result uh, we see here we plot uh, the peak ground velocity from uh, west to east and from south to north without the city, which is the black line, and with the presence of the city. And here there is a snapshot of the displacement of the buildings. This is the church of Christ Church, and, and this is one of the other tallest um, buildings that are there. And let me show you a quick movie. So this is 
So this, uh, these snapshots over here are taken from this movie. So this is, okay, New Zealand, and then there is a zoom. Christchurch is over here. So it's not that big, but uh, it, it may have an active influence on, on, on the propagation of waves. This is the computational domain we have employed. So this is just a cartoon to show you that we have decomposed it into a number of blocks and then mesh each block independently. And basically you are free to do whatever you want on each of the blocks. So these are the, uh, just to, to tell you that we are using different polynomials approximation degree in each block. And here is the Google uh, picture of the Christchurch. And then on top of this, the simulation now, the waves is coming. It will come. Hopefully. Okay, here it is. This is the displacement measure in centimeters. Then you see. So somehow the uh, the, the biggest uh, buildings retain re the energy and then release it. And this is the cr the church. Here it is. Okay. Okay, I think I'll skip this application. But again, the message is that we can recover Basel. Sorry? Okay. Uh, so this is uh, uh, the Aqua Santa Bridge is very uh, much studied by structural engineers because this is a very old bridge. And its characteristic is that its, the, its two main pillars are located on soil with very different material properties. As you can see in the, these pictures, and these are uh, the characteristic of the soil. And we have again compared our approach with the spectral element, fully spectral element approach. Here we both vary the polynomial approximation degree. So this results into uh, two different uh, simulations, which has approximately, so in the discontinuous setting, we ha save half of the degrees of freedom. And so this is uh, the conforming grid used for the spectral element approach, and this is the corresponding version, which is non-matching as well uh, with a uh, careful tuning of the um, uh, polynomial approximation degree. And you can here, we have registered uh, the horizontal velocity in the receiver, which is located <coughs> on, on the bridge. And basically, you can hardly distinguish by the two computations. So to summarize, uh, within uh, this project, we have uh, built uh, this uh, numerical approach and the corresponding numerical code, which is freely available at this site. It includes uh, uh, different models, uh, different methods. Basically, the key point is the discontinuous Galerkin spectral element approach in a domain decomposition philosophy used to discretize um, the space. And then you can use a uh, different time integration scheme, but basically we mostly use the, uh, the leapfrog time integration. And the, the only thing I want to point out, if you have a look at this website, we will find a, a web repository uh, database of uh, seismic earthquake scenarios. So basically, uh, on, a, on, a, on a number of selected regions, uh, we have run um, some simulation, in many cases, hundreds of simulation, varying, for example, the magnitude or the kind of uh, fault rupture or the slip distribution or the profundity of uh, the, the epicenter. And these data are used by Munich Re to um, make uh, estimate. So these are included in their system to make estimate of uh, potential losses and vulnerability of risk of area with uh, a high uh, seismic risk. And uh, this is a list. So the, the, the dots are people or companies or industry uh, or institution that employ speed uh, today to run their simulation. So we, there are a lot of things that are. Uh, so we would like to finish at a certain point and release in the new version, including the coupling with boundary element method to treat exactly the absorbing boundaries uh, um, and to avoid a, a, a refraction, so spurious refraction, as well as discontinuous timing integration schemes, and of course, polytopic grids, which are the results I show you before. 
And so I hope uh, I uh, convince you that uh, somehow the G method can be employed for such kind of problems uh, in a domain decomposition fashion so we can save as much degrees of freedom as we can uh, in, 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 in combination with the, the high accuracy feature by spectral element methods. <laughs> and uh, that's it. Let me thank the grants that support this research. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for this wonderful talk. We have time for questions or comments from the audience. Yes, please. Do you assume any regularity on those coefficients that make uh, a high order scheme more efficient than a lower order one? And then the other, prob the other question is related also to the knowledge of such coefficients. I assume that it is important to have a, an accurate value of those coefficients near the region you want to resolve. On the other hand, to, to the, the value of the precise value of the coefficients far from that region is probably not really essential. Can you comment about all these, please? Yes, thank you very much for the question. Uh, no, from the, of course, at the theoretical uh, level, uh, the more heterogeneous you have, uh, this, of course, will enter in the constants. At the practical level, if you, uh, everything works, but, uh, uh, so we have no evidence that if you have a very large ratio, as it may happen in, in, in real application, there is no, um, uh, there is no effect on the kind of the numerical simulation, provided that, of course, uh, you take into account when you create uh, your block and when you uh, plug in your discrete points uh, so you can either refine the grid or uh, increase the polynomial approximation degree in order to have enough points per wavelet and everything works but of course at the theoretical level in the hidden constant there is always the dependence on basically the maximum and the minimum so the on, on the how large is the constant contrast and for practical uh, so and on the uh, availability of data for practical simulation, this of course uh, it may be a problem. That was not the case, for example, of the Emilia earthquake uh, there. The data were really available because basically we know everything about uh, pop plane, but uh, they are strongly influ influenced by uncertainty, of course, uh, and so this at a certain point we should, we have to take into account uncertainty in such kind of simulation. I strongly agree. Thank you, Paula. Very impressive simulations. Thank you. Uh, I had a curiosity about your um, the simulation you showed on the New Zealand uh, city. Uh, I was wondering, so here you, you took a fully coupled approach where you resolved at the same time the macro scales and the little uh, scales in the, in the city. I was wondering if this is really necessary and if you have compared to an uncoupled uh, simulation where you first resolve the macro scales and then you take this as a boundary condition for resolving the, the small scales. Uh, th th thanks, Fabio, for the question. Uh, the answer is no. For, so for the moment, we have solved just the fully coupled problem. Let me also point out, I didn't tell you this before, uh, the, here we are using a linear elastodynamics also to describe the building, which of course is a very, very rough approximation. So for sure, if you plug here a more realistic nonlinear model, then you have to go through this uh, couple approach where you solve the different scales in separate times. But for the moment, we have not done it yet. Thank you. I would also have a question. You've chosen the time-dependent approach for simulations. Is there also interest in the time harmonic case where you assume that the excitation is time harmonic and you solve a, a 
like a Helmholtz type okay. equation on this discretized operator. Okay, uh, from the theoretical point of view, so I have two uh, different questions. From the theoretical point of view, absolutely yes. Uh, this, uh, we are very much interested in this and also with the couplet with acoustic waves uh, to deal with different kind of problems. And then of course you have to go for this uh, time harmonic approach. As for the practical applications, so to the best of my knowledge, I've never seen this, uh, but uh, 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 it is of co for sure of interest. I mean, to, to, to look at the problem from the time harmonic point of view. That's interesting. Thank, Thank you. you. More questions or comments? Uh, yes, the microphone is coming. Thank you, Paula, for the very interesting Thank talk, you. of course, and uh, very impressive presentation. So I have a question very simple indeed. Um, in, at a certain point, you showed us um, residual displacement uh, in the field. Maybe was it in the... Uh, I don't remember L'Aquila or something, the one with residual displacements, but uh, no, the, the up, uh, up ground, uh, yeah, the yeah. upground. Okay, so yeah. the conceptually maybe I missed some pieces because uh, the model is linear elastic. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what is the origin of the residual displacement at the end? So. I so the, the ground is vibrated according to the seismic excitation, and at a certain po sorry, at a certain point, you get the rest. So you don't observe any more any other displacement. But this doesn't tell you that. Uh, so there is no uh, residual displacement at the end. So this basically tells us what happens. So the distance between the original point and the, 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 the corresponding point at the end of the simulation, so where everything is becomes stationary. Uh, and we measure this distance, and this plot are, and this tells you a measure of the up, uh, the permanent ground uplift. uplift so after that, the that is the magnitude of the displacement. This at is that the point magnitude of the, the, the measure during the simulation. Yes, okay. yes. Thank you very much. <coughs> Any more questions or comments? I would have one more if I dare. <laughs> Maybe I missed it, but are you using locally adaptive time stepping like Marcus Grote proposes yes. if you have these highly uh, variable mesh sizes? Yes. That's, uh, that's uh, a, 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 a absolutely a great question. No, for the moment, uh, no, but this is one of the first points on our dream list uh, because uh, the point with Marcus Grote approach and with most of the papers that we have found on, on, on the market is that uh, Usually people start for the second order PDEs, so the semi-discretized, and they rewrite it as a first order system. Mm. And we cannot do cannot it, do because, it you know. because it's too big. So this is exactly the idea behind this uh, DG method of lines we are developing, looking directly to the second order and equation, then and then on top okay. of this mounting the, the, um, yes. the, the, the adaptive uh, integration uh, scheme where each block goes basically on its yes, own yes. way. The point is that this method we have developed as a condition number which is crazy. So here comes the problem of developing preconditions. Yes, okay. <laughs> so. okay. There any more questions or comments from the audience? Yes, please. Uh, very nice. I liked Thank it very much. Uh, I would like to know if it's possible to introduce uh, some uh, fracture inside uh, to simulate uh, you know, the breaking of uh, the faults. And uh, if uh, the approach is, uh, can be really adapted to, to simulate this kind of things or is too hard? No, absolutely. Uh, this is exactly what we are doing right now. So to using almost the same technology, to especially the ones on polytopic grids, to, to study flows in fracture porous media. Because apparently when you have a thousand and thousand of fracture, the really hard work is in mesh generation. So now we have this approach that basically cuts elements as as they want. No, uh, to sorry, I wanted to say if you can simulate the formation of fractures. Not oh, no, the, the formation, fracture. no, absolutely no, no, no. no not okay. with this technologi technology. Okay, so let's uh, thank uh, once more uh, for this thank wonderful you. talk. <laughs>